Welcome to lab one. In this lab, we're going to be learning how to focus using oil immersion microscopy. And we're also going to use this lab to be able to determine the sizes, shapes, arrangements, and forms of bacteria. Something we'll be using in every lab where there's a microscope and very often using in a lecture as well. So these are terms we have to get down. And as uh, I'll be mentioning when we have our introduction to our first classes, um, you're going to do this and come prepared ahead of time so that you can recognize shapes, arrangements, and forms. So this is a lab you need to prepare with ahead of time uh, so that when we get into lab, we can just strictly work on practicing the focusing. I'll be giving very little introduction on that, and I'd exp I'll expect you to know the shapes or arrangements or forms uh, and to measure the sizes of bacteria. So this is the first lab uh, where we have YouTube videos to watch on laboratory techniques. And you have a pre-lab quiz you have to take on Blackboard prior to that day's lab to prepare you for the lab. And here's the three videos you'll be watching, preliminary tips for using a microscope, the most important one, focusing using oil immersion microscopy or 1000 magnification, and finally, focusing using low magnification or a 10x objective. Now also remember at the end of every lab exercise are a list of performance objectives. And that's what you need to know for the lab quizzes. The first lab quiz covers the introduction to the lab manual and labs one through four. So this is the first of the four labs that will be on lab quiz one. And as I mentioned when we talked about objectives, if the objectives fall under discussion, then that's usually content or theoretical material that you would answer by means of short answer, multiple choice, or matching questions. And if the re objectives fall under results, then those are often practical questions. Now, in the first couple of labs, I'll go through the objectives with you to remind you they're there. After that, I'll just assume that you're doing the objectives. Most people will answer the objectives, write them out, and then learn them so you're all ready for the first lab quiz. But after today's lab, you should be able to state the three basic shapes of bacteria. So if I say shape, you should know which of those three terms to use, coccus, bacillus, or spiral, as we'll see. State and describe five different arrangements of cocci. State and describe three different arrangements of bacilli state and describe three different spiral forms, and describe the appearance of a typical yeast. So those could be theoretical questions. And then practical questions under results, when given an oil immersion microscope, a prepared slide, and an ocular micrometer, determine the size of that organism in micrometers. So make sure you know the unit we're using to measure, micrometer, one one millionth of a meter. So again, these results objectives are pretty specific. It tells you what I'm going to give you or show you and what you have to tell me. Uh, number two, using a microscope, identify different bacterial shapes, arrangements, and forms. So if I ask you for the shape, you'd give me the shape name. If I ask you for arrangement, you'd give me the arrangement name. If I ask you for a form of a spiral, then you'd give me the form name. Again, you don't have to know the name of the bacterium, the scientific name. Uh, all we can tell at this point is the shape and possibly arrangement and form. You should be able to differentiate a yeast from a coccus shaped bacterium by size. We're measuring today with an ocular micrometer, so on the quiz you'll have the measuring device. Uh, remember, as we'll be seeing, a yeast is eukaryotic and much larger than a coccus shaped bacterium, and we'll see what size they are when we measure them. And then kind of a non-testable one, but one to drive how small these bacteria are home. Compare the size of the microorganisms in a lab today with the diameter of your hair under the same magnification. And don't forget the end of every lab exercise, I give you a self quiz you can use to practice as well as answers. And especially to get ready for lab one, I've given you a table here that has pictures of 15 different slides. So you can practice recognizing shapes, arrangements, and forms. So uh, go through these and practice till you can name them without even thinking. Uh, you can click on the slide and then the answer.
So with that in mind, let's get back to the content of today's lab. Now, the first thing is recognizing bacterial shapes, arrangements, and forms, part A. Now, bacteria are single-celled prokaryotic microbes, and they divide by binary fission, where one bacterium splits in two. And in our first lecture, we'll be looking at pro and eukaryotic cells and reviewing all of that. But bacteria, remember, are the only cell types that are prokaryotic. So for example, here's a scanning electron micrograph of a bacillus uh, that's dividing as seen under an electron microscope. And this shows the characteristics of a prokaryotic cell, no nuclear membrane around the DNA, no internal membrane bound organelles. And here's a scanning electron micrograph of salmonella dividing, undergoing binary fission. So our first point, you have to recognize the three shapes of bacteria. So if I ask for shape, that means you're, only, you're going to give me either coccus, bacillus, or spiral. Those are the shapes. So you have to know those are the three shapes. Now the cocci, cocci is plural of coccus, come in five different arrangements, and we'll look at each of these down here. The bacilli, bacilli is plural of bacillus, come in three different arrangements. And the spirals come in three different forms. Uh, they don't stick together to form an arrangement, so we call them forms rather than arrangements. So let's start out with a coccus shape. Uh, Cocca-shaped bacteria are usually spherical, although they can appear oval, elongated, that might be flattened on one side, but they're basically spherical. And most cocci are around one half to one micrometer in diameter. And remember, as we learned in the introduction to the lab manual, a micrometer is one one millionth or 10 to the minus six meters. Now, based on the planes of division, and the tendency to remain attached after they divide, they can appear in one of five arrangements. Figure 1A shows you a drawing of them. So here are the arrangements. If I ask for the arrangement of a coccus, it would be either diplococcus, streptococcus, tetrad, sarsina, or staphylococcus. Now, one thing you'll need to keep in mind when we start looking at actual slides is that when you smear the bacteria on a glass slide, especially when we take them off of a Petri plate, when the bacteria are growing on a Petri plate, they're all growing in a solid mass. They're all stuck together. So first of all, when you mix the bacteria from a Petri plate in a drop of water to spread them out and separate them, they don't all separate in a nice arrangement. Some remain clumped together. And a clump is not an arrangement. Now, as we'll see in a minute, a staphylococcus is a particular type of cluster. It's one that's no more than maybe three, four, five cells across, and often they taper like grapes. But any cluster bigger than that is just a cluster. And you see that on any slide with any organism, bacteria that are stuck together from making the slide, they didn't separate out completely when you tried to spread them out. But also some of these arrangements break apart. So if a staphylococcus broke apart, you might see some short chains and some pairs and some singles, but mostly you'll see this predominant arrangement. And we'll show that in a few of the slides coming up. So those are the terms we use if I ask you for arrangement of a coccus. Now, if they divide in one plane, the sphere just splits in two, that gives you either a diplococcus or a streptococcus arrangement. Diplococcus means pair, diplo means pair, and streptococcus would be chains of varying length. Although keep in mind, these can break apart sometimes when you smear them on a slide. So here we see a photomicrograph of a diplococcus. This is Neisseria gonorrhoeae, which is a diplococcus, and you see cocci in pairs here. Now, some of them did break apart. You see some single ones, but mostly what we're seeing are pairs. And there isn't a single coccus arrangement. They typically tend to remain attached in one arrangement or another. 
Uh, here's Streptococcus pneumoniae, the pneumococcus under a scanning electron microscope, where you can see it's a diplococcus, two cocci attached. Or Neisseria gonorrhea, another diplococcus. And in fact, the uh, Neisseria gonorrhea tends to remain flattened where the two sides meet, and you can even see this under a conventional microscope. Uh, but as you see, that's cocci in pairs, and it's dividing in one plane. Now, if they remain attached in chains longer than two, chains of varying length, we call that a streptococcus arrangement, a chain of cocci. Strepto means chain. And here we see the photomicrograph of streptococcus pyogenes, which causes streptococcal pharyngitis. And so with the streptococcus, we see these chains of varying lengths. Some of them break apart again, but we do see chains of varying lengths. And here's streptococcus pyogenes under an electron microscope where we see a chain of four on a cell. And in lab 14, we'll be looking at streptococci that live in the intestines, and they belong to the genus Enterococcus, but they have a streptococcus arrangement. And again, you see a lot of chains here. They're kind of in mass here. Uh, so you do see some little clusters in that tube, but you do see predominantly chains. Now, if the cocci divide in two planes, we call that a tetrad arrangement. As we see in our drawing, a tetrad is a square of four when it divides in two planes. So here we see Micrococcus luteus under the microscope, and you see these nice little groups of four forming a square. Now again, they don't all separate when you smear them on a slide. So that's not a Staphylococcus, that's just a clump of bacteria. If you look closely, you see that that little clump is made of squares of four. So you have to look carefully where the bacteria are separated so you can see the true arrangement, which in this case would be tetrad. Now actually, as I mentioned in a minute, uh, a Sarsina, the next group is a cube of eight, four on top of four. But when we look at them under the microscope, we're looking down at the top. So uh, with the microscopes we have, it's very difficult to tell whether it's a tetrad or a sarsina, whether it's a square of four or a cube of eight. So generally, when we're looking at bacteria in our lab, if we see arrangements that look like squares of four, we just say it's a tetrad or a sarsina. We give both names. And in fact, bacteria that can grow as a tetrad can often grow as a sarsina under different growth conditions anyway. Here's an indirect stain of Micrococcus luteus where you see the fours very nicely, the groups of four. Again, you always see these big clumps on slides where the bacteria don't separate if they come off a Petri plate. So you have to look where the bacteria are isolated and you see these nice groups of four. Now, of course, some of them do break apart along the way, but the predominant arrangement are these groups of four. So again, we typically say that was a tetrad or sarsina since it's hard to tell a square of four from a cube of eight. And here's a scanning electron micrograph of Micrococcus luteus where you see one of the nice squares of four. And it got that from dividing in two planes. If it divides in three planes, that produces a sarsina arrangement, and a sarsina is a cube of eight, four on top of four. But again, it's very hard to tell whether it's a tetrad or a sarsina looking down on top of it. So if we see what appear to be fours in a square arrangement, we say it's a tetrad or a sarsina. This happens to be a sarsina, but again, as you can see, it'd be very hard to tell that from a uh, tetrad arrangement. And then if division is in random planes, we call that a staphylococcus arrangement. Staphyl means a bunch of grapes. So these appear in irregular, often grape-like clusters. But again, a staphylococcus grape-like cluster is typically no more than 
maybe four or five bacteria across. Anything bigger than that, just a clump of bacteria that didn't separate. So you want to look for these small cl grape-like clusters, no more than four or five bacteria across. As we see in the illustration then, they do appear as grape-like clusters, although keep in mind they break apart and they don't all separate. So you can see large clumps even with Staphylococcus, which again would just be a clump of Staphylococci. And some of the staph break apart, so you might see some short chains or pairs there as well. But the predominant form of Staphylococcus should be these irregular grape-like clusters, often tapering, no more than four or five across. So let's look at a few of those. Uh, here's a gram stain of Staphylococcus aureus. We'll be looking at that in lab one, in fact. So again, we see the predominant arrangement. We see these nice little grape-like clusters. And again, they're no more than three, four, five bacteria across. Every one of those is a Staphylococcus arrangement. Now, some of them break apart. So we see short chains, pairs, and singles. Uh, some of them just get kind of clumped together. That's actually a clump of several Staphylococci. But again, these are the Staphylococcal arrangements, these nice little tapering grape-like clusters. So when you see that primarily, that would be a Staphylococcus arrangement. Here's a negative image of a Staphylococcus. Again, you see these nice little grape-like clusters that form only three, four, five cells across at most. And here we see it under a scanning electron microscope where we see these nice grape-like clusters of bacteria. Here's a nice shot from a scanning electron microscope of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, where again, we see all these nice little grape-like clusters. But again, only three, four, five cells across. So those are the cocci. And uh, you need to recognize that the shape is coccus and then tell me what arrangement you see. Diplococcus, streptococcus, tetrad or sarsina, or staphylococcus. And then you'll be measuring the diameter of a single coccus, not a cluster or a chain, but a single coccus. And again, a single coccus is usually about one half to one micrometer in diameter. Now our second shape is the bacillus shape, sometimes called rod shape. And these are actually hot dog shaped bacteria. And they come in one of three arrangements, which we see in figure 2A here. Uh, most common, we have bacillus, where after it divides, the two cells separate and they appear as a single bacillus. So the shape is bacillus and the arrangement is bacillus in that top case. But we have to be very careful with bacilli because they divide by binary fission. One cell splits in two. And so a dividing bacillus, like we see here, could be mistaken for a diplococcus. And after the two separate, it might look like two cocci. So anytime you see what might appear to be a diplococcus or a single coccus, look around carefully for little hot dogs. As long as you see some with a bacillus shape, you know that the rest of them are simply dividing bacilli. And people do confuse that on quizzes and even on final lab projects sometimes. The second arrangement is bacilli in chains, streptobacillus. Again, strepto means chain, so streptococcus is a chain of cocci. Streptobacillus is a chain of bacilli. And then there's one arrangement you won't have to recognize because we can't really tell it that easily under the microscope. And we don't look at any of these through the semester, but that's cocobacillus. These are very short bacteria that look similar to a coccus that still divide by binary fission, but they are very short rods, but they grow and lay down cell wall more like a bacillus than like a coccus. So we need to recognize the bacillus arrangement, a single bacillus, and bacillus, of course, is also the shape in that case. And then this would be a streptobacillus arrangement. You need to know what a coccobacillus is, a very short bacillus looking similar to a coccus, but you don't have to recognize that one under a microscope. So here's a single bacillus looking at some E. coli and a gram stain, and we see these nice little hot dog shaped bacteria. This is a pretty long one. Uh, most E. coli are more like that. So again, we can see they look like little hot dogs, but you have to look carefully because a dividing bacillus can look a little bit like a diplococcus. You see a number of bacilli here in the process of dividing, 
that could be mistaken for a diplococcus, one that's just divided, might look uh, more like a coccus. But as long as we see little hot dogs in there, we know that this is, in fact, a bacillus. Here's an electron micrograph of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, another bacillus. You see the hot dog, actually it looks a little more like a corn dog, uh, but that's the typical bacillus shape. And here's one of the bad E. coli. Most E. coli is microbiota in our intestines, but there are a few strains of E. coli called diarrheogenic E. coli that can cause diarrhea and even hemorrh hemorrhagic colitis. Uh, this is the one that causes that, the bad E. coli you hear about every now and then. But again, you see it's a bacillus shape, but if it's in the process of dividing, it could look similar to a diplococcus. And then a streptobacillus would be bacilli in chains. And here we see a photomicrograph of a streptobacillus. So you see a number of bacilli connected together in a long chain. And then, I, as I said, a coccobacillus uh, is an oval-shaped bacillus similar to a coccus. Acinetobacter uh, is a gram-negative that is a coccobacillus. So, in fact, you can see that these are very small bacilli. And when they're in the process of dividing, they're even smaller yet. So these are dividing ones once they've just divided. So again, uh, you don't have to recognize that because that would be very hard to tell from a, uh, from a uh, coccus or even sometimes a streptococcus if they're dividing. So you don't have to recognize the coccobacillus shape, but that is actually a very tiny round, uh, oval bacillus. Now a single bacillus is typically about one half to one micrometer wide, maybe one to four micrometers long. But again, remember if it's a dividing bacillus, it can look like a diplococcus. So anytime you see diplococcus, always double check to make sure it's not a dividing bacillus. Look for the hot dogs. Our third and final shape is the spiral shape, and they come in one of three forms. Since they don't remain attached, we don't call them arrangements, but rather forms. And those forms are vibrio, Spirillum, which is a thick, rigid spiral, or spirochete, which is a thin, flexible spiral. So a vibrio is an incomplete spiral or a comma-shaped bacterium. This is vibrio cholera. And you see the little curve shapes here. They look like a curved rod or a bent rod. That's actually an incomplete spiral. And here's Vibrio cholera under a scanning electron microscope, where again, you see they look like a curved rod or an incomplete spiral. And they're typically about the size of a bacillus. Now, much longer and much thicker is the spirillum. A spirillum is a thick, rigid spiral. So in a spirillum, you see very definite, uh, rather rigid looking waves. They're quite thick. They have rather large diameter. And so uh, keep in mind, these are uh, spiral-shaped cylinders, so they do have a diameter. They're round in cross-section. Whereas a spirochete is a thin, flexible spiral. Uh, the waves in it are much more irregular. It's very thin. These are, in fact, some of the thinnest bacteria we have. And in fact, it looks like you took a very fine pointed pencil and made a little squiggly line with it if it's a spirochete. So here is a photomicrograph of a spirillum. Now, as we see in this particular one, we do actually see the spirals in it. But when we heat fix these bacteria to a slide so they don't wash off, what often happens is the spirals flatten out on the slide and it winds up more looking like this one here. So most of the time when we see a spirillum under the microscope, it looks like an extended S shape, but it has very rigid waves to it and a nice thickness to it, so it's easy to measure. But it is actually a spiral in its native state when it's in a liquid. Whereas a spirochete is a thin, flexible spiral, 
compared to the thick rigid spiral of the spirillum. And here is a photomicrograph of Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. That's a spirochete. But you notice how much thinner that is in a spirillum and how much more irregular the waves are. And it looks like a very little thin wavy pencil line. And here's a spirochete that causes syphilis, uh, Treponema pallidum, which we'll be looking at in lab. Again, you see this, the waves in it are much more irregular. It's very thin, very wavy looking. And so measuring these becomes a little difficult. What we're going to do is just kind of estimate the uh, length from one end to the other for length, ignoring the waves in it. And then the width, of course, would be the cross section here. In the spirillum, uh, these will be quite large. So again, for the length, we'd go from here to here, ignoring the waves, and then measure the width. Here's an electron micrograph of the spirochete leptospira that causes leptospirosis. You see how thin the, spiral, the bacterium is with the spirals, and the spirals are much more flexible looking. And here's Treponema pallidum under an electron microscope, another spirochete. So the spirals, especially the spirillum and the spirochetes, can get very long. The ones we're looking at can range from 5 to 40 micrometers long. Some of the spirochetes can get, or some of the spirilla can get over 100 micrometers long. Now, the spirochetes tend to be the thinnest of the bacteria. Uh, when you measure them today, their width is only going to be about one quarter to one half of a micrometer. So those are the shapes, arrangements, and forms of spiral of a bacteria. Now, in addition to the prokaryotic bacteria, we're going to look at one eukaryotic cell today, baker's yeast, the one you used to make bread. That's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this is a single-celled fungi, and fungi have eukaryotic cell types. So uh, this is baker's yeast uh, that's been stained as viewed under a microscope. And we see how much bigger this is than a caca-shaped bacterium. This is the same magnification that we looked at on the bacterial slides. And as we'll see in a minute, they reproduced asexually by budding. So being eukaryotic, they're generally bigger than prokaryotic bacteria. Now remember we said a caca-shaped bacterium is about one half to one micrometer in diameter. Whereas the yeast we're looking at today could be anywhere from three to five micrometers in diameter, much larger. And the yeast reproduce asexually through a process called budding, where following mitosis, a bud forms around one of the nuclei and pinches off. And here we see some yeast budding. So following mitosis, a bud forms around one nucleus and pinches off. So that is a budding yeast cell, buds coming off the mother cell. And here's a scanning electron micrograph of Baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, so you can see a number of these forming buds. There's a nice little bud there. Here's one that's budding. And after the bud breaks off, it actually leaves behind what are called bud scars. So the same yeast may bud several times as it keeps undergoing mitosis and dividing its nucleus. Now, one of the things we're going to be doing today is measuring these microorganisms. And we're going to measure them using an ocular micrometer, an eyepiece that has a scale in it. And that scale becomes superimposed on the focus specimen. So figure five shows you a portion of an ocular micrometer. Now, the way these micrometers are constructed is that when we're using 1,000 magnification, that is oil immersion microscopy, the distance between any two lines on the scale is about one micrometer. So this is a streptococcus that we're looking at here. A single streptococcus here it would be one micrometer in diameter. So from zero to here would be one micrometer. Remember zero to 10 would be 10 micrometers. So when we measure, we want to measure in micrometers. 
So this chain of streptococci would be five micrometers long, but a single bacterium in that chain would be one micrometer in diameter. Now, some of the things we measure today will be even smaller than one space. So if we happen to see an organism that's maybe only from here to here, half of a space, then we'd say that's 0.5 micrometers. So what we do if it's less than one space, one micrometer, we round it off to the nearest quarter. Like we say, it's uh, 0.75 micrometers or three quarters. 0.5 micrometers or half a micrometer, 0.25 micrometers or quarter of a micrometer. And that lets us know that it's even smaller than one space, smaller than one micrometer. And of course, as you move the mechanical stage around, that'll move the bacteria so you can line them up better against the scale. But that only applies when we're using oil immersion microscopy, where one space equals one micrometer. That's under a thousand magnification, which is all we use. So that's how we'll be measuring today. And on a quiz, if you have a microscope with a scale and a slide, you should be able to measure the organism and tell me its size in micrometers. Make sure you remember the unit we use to measure bacteria, micrometer, one one millionth of a meter or 10 to the minus six meters. Now the next section deals with focusing using oil immersion. Again, you have videos that you've watched, that you're gonna watch on that. Now, as we go through our first lab, we're the class is gonna focus on the first slide together. We're gonna to go through this step-by-step step from beginning to end uh, as a class and see that you should be able to focus. So as long as you follow these steps, you will see stuff under the microscope, no matter how little luck you've had in the past. But if you don't follow these steps, if you miss even one of the steps or you do one of these steps wrong, you'll see nothing. So it's easy to focus. You just have to follow some steps. And keep in mind, the first two lab quizzes are going to have a focusing question, practical question where you're going to focus a slide for me. So you need to learn these steps and how to focus using oil immersion so we can do it quickly. And if you follow these steps, you should see stuff within about 30 seconds. And if it's taking much longer than that, you probably made a mistake in the focusing. So just sitting there cranking knobs will not let you see things. You have to follow the steps in a sequential form, and then it works perfect. So we're going to go through that step by step and show you how easy it is to focus using oil immersion microscopy. So uh, here's the various bacteria and things we're going to be looking at today under specimens and the procedure you'll be doing. Now again, a few tips when you start looking at things under the microscope. Remember, once you have something in focus, feel free to move the slide around until you see an area that represents the true arrangement, shape, or form. Often the first place you look isn't very good. There might be so few bacteria you can't see an arrangement, you may not even be able to focus in that area. Or there might be just blob of bacteria piled on top of one another. And you can get that glob in focus, but it tells you nothing. You need to move the slide around till you find a good area where you see separated bacteria and you can tell the shape or the arrangement or the form. So remember when you show me stuff today, make sure you move the slide around that has a good arrangement that looks like it's supposed to look before you call me over. Keep in mind that some of the cockle arrangements will clump together. Uh, and that's not a staphylococcus, it's a clump. Every slide, whether it's a, um, a vibrio or whether it's a bacillus or whether it's a coccus has clumps where bacteria simply don't separate when you smear the bacteria on the slide. And some of the arrangements break apart. So again, you have to look carefully to find the true arrangement. And remember that small bacilli when dividing might look like a coccus. And keep in mind, bacilli do not divide to form clusters. I get people saying on quiz, it's a staphylobacillus. There is no such thing. That's a clump of bacilli. Uh, there is no staphylobacillus arrangement. There's only bacillus or streptobacillus or cocobacillus. So the main goal today is to get through the first four slides and hopefully step three where you're going to use prepared microscope slides to look at four different bacteria, where you're going to focus on each one of these individually, find a good area, take a look at it so you know the, what the shape and the arrangement or the form is, 
then call me over and I'll be asking what's the shape or what's the arrangement or what's the form. So the first slide is the one we'll actually do as a class because it's easiest to find Staphylococcus aureus. First of all, the arrangement is very easy here because the bacterium happens to be named after its arrangement. This has a Staphylococcus arrangement, cocci and irregular grape-like clusters, and that's what the genus is named after its arrangement. And of course, the shape would be coccus. Now, once you get that in focus, make sure you find a good area where you can actually see the Staphylococcus arrangements. Not where they're just a big glob of bacteria forming a solid mass, but we can see actual arrangements. And then you want to measure the diameter of a single coccus using your ocular micrometer. We're going to look at Escherichia coli. E. coli is a small bacillus. It's normal floor of the intestinal tract. It's the most common cause of urinary tract infections. And uh, you're going to estimate the length and width of a typical bacillus. <coughs> so here's col E. coli as it appears. And find one that's definitely hot dog shaped and measure the length and width of that. By the way, I didn't mention, but Staphylococcus aureus uh, most commonly causes abscesses of the skin. An abscess is a pus-filled inflamed lesion. It's also a common cause of wound infections and surgical wound infections. The third bacteria we'll look at today is Treponema pallidum. This is a spirochete, a thin flexible spiral, and this is a spirochete that causes syphilis you're gonna measure the length and width of a typical spirochete. Now these do tend to tangle up on the slide. So move it around a little till you find one that's not tangled up or not too tangled up, where you can measure the length, ignoring the waves in it, and the width. And you'll notice this is so thin, it's gonna be very hard to estimate the width. They're only about one quarter of one space, a quarter of a micrometer or 0.25 micrometers. And finally, we're going to look at a spirillum species, which is a thick, rigid spiral. And this bacterium is named after its form. And so again, you may not, you may not see any that have actual spirals after the slide's made, but this is pretty typical down here. So length would be just from this end to this end, ignoring the waves. And this, of course, would be the width here. Uh, step two you're going to do at home, just click on these for practice. This gives you some online pictures so you can practice recognizing shapes and arrangements, which again, we need to have down pretty cold. Uh, so once you look at the four bacteria under step one, return those slides to the trays. Make sure you wipe the oil off of the slide with a Kim wipe, not lens paper, but a Kim wipe before you put the slide back in the tray and take one slide at a time. When you're done, return that, grab another one till you've seen all four of them. You don't have to do that in any particular order. Then try to get through step three, make a wet mount of baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So in this case, using a pipette, you're gonna put a small drop of yeast on a clean microscope slide, and then put a cover slip on top of that. Then your oil goes on top of the cover slip. Now, since these are living, unstained yeast, we have to reduce the light to get enough contrast to see them. Remember for the bacterial slides up here, you're having the iris diaphragm set at about 0.9, the light most almost wide open to get enough light to see the bacteria. But if you use that much light on the yeast, you won't even see them, they'll be washed out with all the light. So we have to move that iris diaphragm lever almost all the way to the right to see the yeast. So remember, you have to reduce light with the iris diaphragm lever. And then measure the diameter of a typical yeast. Now, when you first see them, it'll look like they're swimming very rapidly. Uh, that's just drifting. When you uh, do the focusing, the lens is pushing on the oil, which is pushing on the cover slip, which is pushing on the water. And so that squishes the water and the yeast drift with the water. So when you see them all moving same speed, same direction, that's mo not motility, that's drifting. We don't see a lot of synchronous swimming in microbes. When they're actually swimming, they start, they stop, they change direction, they bump into one another. But some of them will be stuck to the cover slipper, to the slide, and you can easily measure the diameter. 
And of course, notice how much bigger it is than a caca-shaped bacterium, because one of your objectives says, tell a yeast from a caca-shaped bacterium by size under the microscope, meaning you're gonna measure it. Now, if you finish the yeast slide, discard the cover slip and the broken glass disposal container, wash the slide with tap water, dry it with a paper towel, and you can use the same slide for step four to make a wet mount of your hair. We may or may not have time to get to that depending on how quickly you focus and how long you have to wait for me to come around and check you off. But if you have time to do the hair, do it because it's interesting. So you're gonna remove a small piece of hair from your head, put it in a small drop of water on a microscope slide, put a cover slip on, drop of that, on top of that, and then a drop of oil, and focus on your hair using oil immersion microscopy. Now that'll be the hardest thing to find. It's huge, but there's only one on the slide, and you may think you have the hair lined up under the lens, you don't. Uh, the opening that the light goes through in that oil immersion lens is smaller than the diameter of the head of a pin. So you're trying to line up a hair in a circle smaller than the head of a pin, and you can't see where the circle is. So what I normally do to try to focus on a hair is I would go through the normal focusing steps where you raise the stage till it touches the oil, turn the fine focus forward about where you think focus would be, but not worry about whether the hair is under the lens, then as you look through the lens, once you think it's about where focus is, move the hair towards the lens. And it's so big that when it comes under the lens, it'll block light and you can find it. Uh, another possibility is to focus on it with 10X and then uh, get it dead center and then switch to oil immersion. Now, if you finish with the hair slide, both the slide and the cover slip will go in the broken glass container. And of course, before you put the microscope away, make sure you remove the oil from the oil immersion lens using lens paper. Remember, before you put the scope away, uh, turn the uh, control light on the base of the scope back to uh, one, as low as it'll go. Then turn the microscope off, wrap the cord up, and then using two hands, carry it back and put it in the microscope cabinet with the eyepieces facing out. Now, as you look at each slide today, record the results on your hard copy of the lab manual. Uh, on the online lab manual, it actually shows you a picture of what it should look like to help you review for the practicals. But once you see staff ORIS, draw a few of them to scale as big as they look to you under the microscope. Uh, record the diameter in micrometers, tell me the shape and the arrangement. For E. coli, our bacillus-shaped bacterium, again, measure the length and width in micrometers, tell me the shape. For treponema pallidum, our spirochete, measure the length in micrometers, the width in micrometers, tell me the shape and the form. Uh, for spirillum, our thick rigid spiral, Again, measure the length and the width in micrometers. Give me the shape and form. Then you can practice on these. I uh, can just click on them and fill this in. You won't be measuring them because of course you're doing this online. Uh, you're gonna make a drawing of several yeast cells, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now again, these are unstained, so we have to reduce the light to see them. But you wanna notice how much bigger that is than a caca-shaped bacterium. In fact, the caca-shaped bacterium is about the size of that little granule inside the yeast there. So you wanna measure the diameter in micrometers, or if it's more oval, length and width. And finally, if you get to the hair, make a drawing of your hair and measure the diameter in micrometers. Here's what your hair actually looks like under oil immersion. You see how huge that is. And in fact, this is about the size of a caca-shaped bacterium were it to be sitting on your hair. So if you get to the hair, using the scale as a size reference, imagine what all the different microbes you looked at today would look like if they were sitting on your hair. And that'll drive home just how small these microorganisms are compared to something you can see with the naked eye, a human hair. And of course, don't forget to write out and answer your objectives and learn those for the first lab quiz. You can do the self quiz to practice. And remember, I've given you this table here at the end. 
with 15 different slides to look at to practice recognizing shapes, arrangements, and forms. So you want to actually go through all of that and get it down before you come to lab. Because remember, I'm going to assume you know the three shapes, the five arrangements of cocci, the two arrangements of bacilli we need to recognize, and the three forms of spirals. I'll be asking you that and assuming you know that. And again, remember to look rather carefully. For example, on slide two here, a common mistake I see on quizzes is someone looking at that and saying staphylococcus. That's not a staphylococcus. If you look here, we see groups of four. That's a tetrad or sarsina. These are clumps. Every slide has clumps. If it's more than three or four bacteria across, that's not an arrangement. It's just a clump. And even when you look at the clumps, you see the clumps are often made in groups of four. So again, you want to look at isolated bacterium so you can see the true arrangement. And the predominant arrangement we see there are either squares of four or cubes of eight. We can't tell again by looking down on top of that, so we would say it's a tetrad or sarsina. Whereas this is a staphylococcus. So again, now you see lots of little clusters. They're tapering clusters. They're no more than at the most four or five across. Most are smaller than that. Some of them break apart as you smear them on the slide. We see short chains, pairs, singles, but the predominant arrangement we're seeing there is a staphylococcal arrangement. And again, remember you have to be careful on bacilli. Uh, people taking a quick look at that often say it's a diplococcus or coccus. It's not, it's a bacillus. This is an actively dividing culture. So most of these are undergoing binary fission they're splitting in half. And once they do split in half and separate, they look like a coccus. But if we take a look there, we see a bunch of hot dogs. That's a bacillus, that's a bacillus, that's a bacillus. Uh, so as long as we see true bacillus shapes there, we know that the rest are dividing bacilli. So always look carefully for the little hot dogs before you call anything a diplococcus or coccus. And here's a more typical uh, bacillus. Uh, that's not as actively dividing. So we see some of them in the process of dividing, but most of these look like little hot dogs. And again, that gives you all the different forms. There's a streptobacillus there, there's a spirillum, there's a spirochete, etc. So those are a lot of slides you can practice with and get that down. Because we'll need to know that for all labs where we use the microscope, and we'll need to know that as well for lecture. So that is your background material for lab one.